Okay. Amanda, my friend, are you ready for this? I'm so ready. All right. We are talking about making the decision to leave an unhealthy marriage. I think you have some experience on this. Absolutely. You're do. looking at me like things just coursed through your mind when I said that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> well, I want to hear your experiences and where necessary, I will fill in some of the gaps because I have plenty of my own. Hmm. But let's get into this. Okay. All right. Welcome to 12 Week Relationships. This is your place for better relationships in weeks, not years. My name is Pi. This is my friend Amanda. You can check her out at Amanda. Well, actually, it's My Mommy the Artist, it isn't is. it? Yep. Okay. My Mommy the Artist. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we're going to get straight into this episode because you have some really interesting experiences. One from kind of the whole process of finding yourself leaving a very toxic marriage. Mm -hmm. And then eventually going down this career path where, well, now you're you're doing several things. Mm -hmm. I am. Yeah. You want to tell us a little about that? Yeah, sure. So right now I am mostly focusing on helping families. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm doing that is because while I have the honor and privilege and the chance to leave that toxic marriage, my children are still technically in it. So yeah, however yeah. my ex-husband was treating me, he's still treating my kids that way. Yeah. And this is how it all started is because I was like, you know, I need to be able to teach my children what a real relationship feels like. Mm -hmm. Because when you are raised by a parent who uses you as an emotional supply or controls you or takes out their anger on you all the time, you, you start to learn how to survive in that. Yeah. You know, you develop all these survival tactics tactics, you know, and you get a little confused as to what love actually is. For sure. And so my worry was as they get older, that they are going to seek out that same kind of behavior in a partner or in friends because it feels familiar. It becomes normalized. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Well, that kind of brought you to, so not only did you, you, you went through the experience of leaving the marriage, mm -hmm. but then you went on to, you, you teach piano. Amanda, yes. we'll get into kind of some of the backstory of how I know you, and yeah. but you're incredibly talented as a oh, musician. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you've taught piano for quite some time, right? Yes. Like 20 something years? 20 something years. Okay. Yeah. And, but you added something else. So, My Mommy the Artist was you teaching parents essentially how to effectively communicate with children. Right. 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 So, I simplified a lot of the concepts of like how to look for red flags, how to have strong boundaries, what a respectful relationship looks like, but I put it all into drawings. That's so cool. Yeah. And so when my, my kids looked at it, they completely understood and we were able to open up these really meaningful conversations about relationships. And yeah. then that, you know, it just evolved and snowballed from there. That's so cool. As a, mm -hmm. I'm also in a co-parenting situation. We have, we have uh, several episodes that we're going to be doing with you. The first one, we're going to go into kind of your backstory and, and okay. this process. And then we're going to talk about your four-step approach to communication with kids and, and, uh, and what it's like co-parenting with a toxic ex. But just as you describe it, what you're saying is something that I really want for my kids, like mm -hmm. this, this program material where they can learn effective patterns of communication, but through a simplified format. Right. It's incredible for people that are in this situation. So I'm excited for that. But why don't we get into just a bit about how I know you? Yeah. And um, <laughs> and then I want to start hearing kind of the story. So I met Amanda when I was 19. Mm -hmm. I was serving a mission in Vancouver, Canada. Yep. And uh, it was a Cantonese Mandarin speaking mission. And you were one of the members in the ward or the church. So for Mormons, you know, when you're 19, you have the choice to go on a, uh, a mission. It's really kind of like encouraged. I don't know that I would say. I was going to say, is it a choice? <laughs> yeah, it's like, a, Sorry. <laughs> you know, it's like you feel like you should go. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. it was actually a, a really fantastic experience for me. And as far as like religious experiences, that was the best experience that I had, uh, period. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible two years, incredible period of growth. But you were one of our <laughs> awesome members in that area. And I just remember you would do these piano performances for us like it, it was incredible it was like a concert pianist oh, right there <laughs> but yeah you were 15 at the i time? was only 15 yeah okay so i've known you for 26 years 27 is that what, is that, what that is maybe like 26 20, that's kind of <laughs> crazy a long time yeah and in that time well we i went home 
you mm -hmm. eventually did you end up in Utah? Where did I did? Okay. I transferred to BYU. Okay. In my uh, junior year. And actually. this is the funny thing is that neither of us practice anymore, right? We're yeah, not active. Not, Mormons, not active but, member. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to get into all of it. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we talk about what brought you to that marriage mm. with your ex? Okay. Well, there are, there are a lot of things that went into it. Okay. Um, I was very, very young, first of all. Like, I was 21 when I married my ex-husband, and we had That's only, such a wild thought. Right? But it's so normal in Utah. It is so normal. And in fact, at the time, I was starting to panic. Yeah. I was, when I was about 20. You were 21 and panicking that you were. At 20, I was panicking because I, I was like, oh, you know what? Everybody around me is getting engaged. And when I say everyone, I'm not exaggerating no you know it, it, it is l literally everyone around you is like oh my ring oh this is how he proposed and it culturally it was a very it was a it was just it was so normal it's like well normal. how did he propose oh how did he propose you know and then everyone's going on dates and it's just a very we're pushing this idea of getting married and so at 20 i was actually panicking a little bit because i was like wow i'm gonna graduate soon and I haven't gotten married yet. I'm an old maid. I actually called myself an old maid. That's the crazy part about this is mm -hmm. I feel like, oh, oh, by the way, I haven't told you. We mm. now have 20,000 monthly downloads on oh the podcast. Oh my goodness, congratulations. So we have to you know, give a big shout out to all the people that are listening. But for yeah, most of the people that are listening, I don't think there are going to be some that have grown up in highly religious environments. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for the most part, this is probably very unusual to hear this. Right. But when you say like you're 21 and you feel this pressure, it, it's not just a, it's not just encouraged. It's like there's literally a social pressure. That yes. This is the norm that mm -hmm. by 21, 22, you should be engaged and you should yep. be getting married. And if not, there's a problem. There, yep. There's something wrong with you. And it's not even... It's not even there's something wrong with your personality or there's wrong with something wrong with your character. It's almost mm -hmm. like there's something wrong with your faith. Mm -hmm. It's like, are you, you know what? Are you being righteous enough? Yeah. Because if you were, God would have blessed you with an eternal companion, which is what they called it, right? Like when you get mm -hmm. married because you um, are married for forever, you know, and everyone was like, oh, he's my eternal companion, da, 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 da. And so there was the pressure wasn't even oh you're not cute enough or you're not smart enough that didn't even matter it was more are you sinning yeah because god hasn't blessed you yet with somebody that you should marry and that was the pressure that i was i was feeling yeah outside yeah. of it it sounds very much cult like you know Absolutely. Um, but the thing is that it's not that was the interesting thing is that for the most part you can look at most you know uh, i guess broad religions and and see that the teachings themselves are, are for the most part good mm -hmm. and i would say the same thing within mormonism that the teachings i i really resonated i really liked the teachings itself at least for the most part mm. um but the culture it, it was so interesting how like the, there's nowhere where the teachings say that you have to get married when you're young but the culture of it yeah. the culture is what drives in my opinion the culture drives 90 percent of your experience because you experience the religious aspects during the few minutes a day when you might be reading, you know, some spiritual material or a Bible or whatever it is, right. or at church. But the other times, which is 90 plus percent of your life, you're experiencing the cultural aspect of it. Right. So, yeah, the, the cultural aspect is is kind of wild and almost cult-like in many ways. Yes, uh, it, it, that's exactly it. And it's, as I reflect on that time in my life, it's interesting that not only was I feeling this pressure from other people, but it was, I was giving myself the pressure that yeah. it was normalized for me to question my own worth as a person, as a daughter of God, you know, like there is something wrong with me. If I'm an old maid, I'm at mm -hmm. BYU where there's tons of eligible Mormon boys to date and marry mm -hmm. what's wrong with me. Yeah. And so I was in a real, I was in a hurry really to marry somebody and, get that box checked off mm -hmm. and start the next one, which is to have children. And that was my only, only priority actually at the moment, at the time. That's so interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. So you're married. My, yeah. And I met my ex-husband August of the year that I was 20 and mm -hmm. we were married by June. Jeez. I met him in August. We didn't even start dating in August. So you're barely 21. Yes. 
And we started officially dating in October. I, I remember it was Halloween, I think. So it was basically November. Yeah. By February, we were engaged. And then we were married June. And one of the hardest things for me, first of all, when you're that young, you, I'm not going to downplay an, a 21-year-old's ability to make decisions, okay? Mm-hmm. Or I'm not saying that you're foolish when you're 21. But, I mean, I was foolish when I was 21. But not only was my ability to see what I really wanted in somebody to spend a life with, it was, compl- it was completely wrong. Yeah. And what I, when I, what I mean by that is all I really cared about was finding someone who also loves God. Mm. Um, I wasn't too worried about compatibility. I wasn't worried about communication skills and ability. I wasn't worried about whether or not this person really even could care for me or mm. had the emotional capacity to care for me, which is all things that I'm considering now as I'm older. And so none of those things mattered. It was like, Hey, I met somebody He likes me. He asked me out. We went to ice cream a couple times and then I met his family and he served a mission. So that's one of the boxes, right? Like, Mm -hmm. oh, he's a return missionary. So I can trust that he's going to be a good husband. I'm not sure why, you know, like that made the, you know, there are all these heuristics, right? There's all these like little short form heuristics that we use hoping that it leads us to like an effective decision. But right. And and that's the, that's the thing about hope too, because I thought if you're a return missionary and I'm a devout, you know, and you, so you're a devout Mormon and so am I, and God's in it. You remember the triangle, right? That they talk about. Then the closer we are to God, the closer we are to each other as, you know. The reference is that basically God is the top point of this triangle that you're the left, you have your spouse as the right. The closer you get to God, the closer closer these points. The closer you are to each other. And so it was like, you know what? We can get through anything together if we believe in God. And this is why it's so easy to make that decision to just get married. Because you, there really wasn't anything else that I cared about. Yeah. You know, in terms of finding a partner for life. Which is also interesting in the being raised Mormon. Is that it's almost like the marriage is the last box you check. And then what about the rest of your life? You don't really consider it. You know, you don't really think about, right. Like you're like, oh, I did it. Now what? Yeah. And now we have to live life together. And then you realize you wake up one day and you're like, oh my goodness, (laughs) you know, this isn't, well, you have children and you can get lost in that too. Yeah. Right. Like, oh yeah, we're raising good children. We're taking them to church. We're doing all the right things. And then something just doesn't feel right. Especially Mm -hmm. when you marry somebody that you weren't a great match with to begin to begin with. Yeah. I always wish there was a lot more education around so many of the different like again some of the concepts are are really great and this isn't to i never want to bag on anyone's faith or religion right but i often feel like within religion you grasp these heuristics these uh heuristics are these you know these little short pieces of okay if you are both drawing closer to god you'll be closer together right Mm -hmm. if you're both devout you'll have a successful relationship. It's these little short form ideas that hopefully get us to a a good Mm -hmm. decision. But in most cases, at least in, in, I'll say in many cases, these heuristics are actually wrong. For example, you can, the triangle is effective as a tool, Mm -hmm. you know, to, to communicate if both people believe in God for the same reason. Right. So, Right. It's not so much that you're both devout, it's that you're devout for the same reasons. But we never actually look into those reasons. Right. We don't realize that many of us are at church because our family members, it, it's mm-hmm. a it's a sign of respect to our parents. Mm-hmm. Many of us are at church because, well, that's our social sphere. Right. Many of us are there because, you know, well, this is just tradition and it's right. what we were taught, right? So you, this is what you do. And there are some that go to church that genuinely want to spiritually grow. Right. But those underlying core values, I mean, the fact that you go to church has no indication of what the actual core value is that's driving Mm -hmm. that desire to go to church. Right. And there's no education around it. There's no talk about it. Absolutely. You just think that, oh, if you're a member, then we're good. Right. And for me personally, the reason why I was at church, when I look back on it, it, I wasn't there for faith. I wasn't there I was there out of fear. Yeah. I got married out of fear. That's a very strong. I had children value. out of fear. Yeah. I had, I got married that quick out of fear. Yeah. You know, like, and that, 
I mean, a marriage based on that, you know, like that wasn't going to last no matter, no matter what, because the reasons why I chose him and the reason why we got married and had kids, reason why we were going to church, reason why we had that triangle with God, it was all fear. For sure. And once you resolve that fear aspect, right? Right. Once you're no longer afraid and once you realize mm-hmm. that I am my own person, right? the desire to go to church goes away because yes. it was never based on something it wasn't based on something spiritual. It wasn't based on that connection. It was based on right. fear. Absolutely. And I, I like what you just said there too, was, you know, when you figure out that you were your own person. So that is one of the hardest things that I dealt with with my faith crisis, I guess you can call if you want, Yeah. Um, is I completely lost who I was for however long I was Mormon. I think a lot of people have that experience. Right. And it's almost like, it's actually quite blatant the way that they present it to you. Like, you know, you are expected to almost only serve God and mm-hmm. the church comes first. And if you, your own thoughts and your own feelings, especially as a woman and even, um, that these are your roles, these are your expectations that becomes your identity for sure. And so my biggest, um, issue looking back is that if you don't know who you are and you have completely lost connection with yourself, your intuition and your gut, you can't make a good decision for yourself. Mm-hmm at all. And so when you are in touch with yourself and something tells you something is wrong, I I remember being taught that if you have any feeling at all, but it's not coming from God, then it's probably coming from Satan. Mm -hmm. And that is a terrifying thing to teach a young person because when it's, when it is your intuition and it, or even your own thought, like, Hey, maybe I shouldn't marry somebody that I've only known for 10 months. And then it's like, oh, but that feeling didn't come from God. So it's probably, it's probably a bad, sinful one. So I'm just going to shove it away. You know, you know, what's funny. There's, um, there's two words that I, in the English language, there's two words that make me cringe Mm -hmm. almost to the exact same level. Mm -hmm. One is the N word, Mm -hmm. which I have been called many times growing up. People would call me a sand N word. Oh. And, uh, Sorry. so yeah, I, I had that experience of, of learning and then wow. actually learning what the word actually meant and attaching it to, wow. and that word deserves the, the cringe that's mm-hmm. a, a, attached to it. You know what the second word is? Mm. Masturbation. Mm. Because in church it was so wrong and so sinful. And so there is so much buildup around, it, it's kind of crazy before you're married, it's a sin and it's not okay. And it's, you know, even masturbation or anything is just so taboo. And if you do it, then you need to go and you need to see the the bishop, the person that's leading the, the, the church and you need to confess. And, and then suddenly you're married and it's, Oh, now, you know, sex is okay now. Yeah. It's fine. And it's like an overnight, like, Oh, like 30 minutes ago, we weren't married. So it is wrong. It's sinful. You're going straight to hell 30 minutes later. Yeah. After like a 10, 10 minute ceremony or whatever it is. And then it's like, okay, go ahead now. And that, that is actually one of the things that, you know, since I always talk about like educating children and things like that and creating, this is one of the things that I have a huge problem with actually in purity culture and mm-hmm. raising your children in purity culture, even when it comes down to speaking about modesty and things like that, because I mean, in the context of a church, yeah. in the context of purity culture, because there is no education on teaching children how to deal with something that's very, very innate and human Sure. There's nothing. All it is is this blanket of like, you're bad if you do this and that's all you're going to get. That's all. Yeah. So go ahead and this is the same thing I feel like with anger, actually, that I actually have a quite a big issue with within the church is because you are expected to act a certain way and you're supposed to follow these rules, but there's no guidance as to what you do with these natural feelings that you have. Sure. Right. So, for example, if you're an... Um, if it's like a sexual desire, right? Nobody teaches you, hey, you know what? This is a normal thing, Yeah. right? This is a normal thing and this is, let's talk about it and let's get to a healthy place, place with it, right? No, it's just, no, nope, don't do that. But the other aspect of it is that it's it's not only normal, it's a critical piece of the human experience. Absolutely. And it's a critical piece of the marriage or long-term relationship that you want to create. Right. So to 
never for it to be taboo and to not know anything about it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it's okay and you've already made the decision to marry and that's never been a factor. Right. But it will be a factor now in your marriage. Mm -hmm. That was insane to me. And, and, and so you spend, you know, I spent the better part of a decade and a half then unwinding yeah. all of that. And to this day, it's still, it's just a weird subject because I, I can still, it's crazy to me that the N word that has so much history and purpose for why it is the N word. Right. In my head, I equate that to masturbation. Right. Something that is natural and, and, and part of the human experience. And yes, it could be good. It could also be bad. If you're using that to not connect with somebody else, then it's a bad thing. But otherwise it's like, it's not a bad thing in and of itself. It's just like alcohol or like any form of drug. If you, when used appropriately, it's fine. Mm -hmm. When not used appropriately, it's not. But you don't get any of that nuance in a church education. Absolutely. I was just going to say that, you know, inside the church, there's so many, there's so much division. It's mm -hmm. good or bad. Are you choosing the right or the wrong? Yeah. Are you doing, you know, there's no... There's no gray area. There's no, everything is good or bad. And that actually factors into your decision making about, you know, about everything. Yeah. It becomes, Every everything kind of becomes black or white. Everything is either good or bad. So if I um, am driving along and I miss a turn, oh, am I being punished for this? Is this good or bad? Or maybe I just missed a turn. Yeah. You know, and so when you have that sort of mindset in every area of your life, you know, like when it comes to, then when you come, it comes to your wedding night, right? Mm -hmm. This is good or bad. Yeah. Right. There's not like anything else. Is this is this good or bad? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, well, it was bad. But now it's good. So I'm good. You know, there's yeah. it like right here. It's just heavy. It's so heavy. There are so many studies that talk about how uh, it's not just Mormons. It's people of every highly religious faith. Um, so in, in Orthodox culture, like Jewish Orthodox culture and in Mormonism and, you know, Jehovah Witness, all the the more kind of fundamental religions where when the young people get married there's entire studies and books on how they now bring sex into their life mm. because it's such a problem it's such a significant yeah. issue that was never really open and discussed before right. and then it becomes a huge problem of like, Absolutely. how do we even encounter this how do we even deal with this well it starts when you're so young too mm -hmm. you know i was think i was recalling my own experience as a young young girl being raised Mormon. So right at the very beginning, you are taught, um, and you can probably, you can speak to the male experience, I guess, but as a young girl being raised in the church, you are getting this idea hammered into your head, first of all, that you need to get married mm -hmm. and you need to be a housewife um, and you need to take care of your home and you need to take care of everything else because your husband is leading the home. So you do everything to support them, right? But at the same time, we are taught this idea of modesty, Right. I have been pulled aside at church before when I was younger um, by a friend's mom mm -hmm. who said to me, I can see your body when you're wearing that dress. And she wanted me to go home and change. Now, the, my, my problem with this is you are basically telling because within the church, you're kind of taught like, why are you, why are we being modest? We are being modest because we don't want to tempt boys. Yeah. to sin because if they sin they can't go on their missions they can't get the priesthood which if you're listening and you know you're you don't um you're not familiar with mormonism the priesthood is basically like the power of god i guess given to man but only men can hold it mm -hmm. so is it's basically like an honor and a privilege and you're it's a goal to work towards right and so um as a young female that was what i okay my clothing choices is based on making sure that if I wear this, that a, a boy is not going to look at me and lust after me. So I was almost responsible for that person's thoughts. That's exactly how it's presented because right. there's very little focus on that for the guys. Right. So it's almost, okay, so I have, I have many issues with this, but I want to ad address this thing about the boys for a second because mm -hmm. I feel so badly for um, Mormon boys. Because guess when you're teaching that the girl is control of your thoughts, that also means you are just an animal. Yeah. You have no, you have no actual ability to control yourself. Right. Like what kind of, why are we teaching boys this, you know? And then you're like, Oh, by, but by the way, here's the power of God. Here you go. You yeah. know? And then, Oh, by the way. Um, so 
and being the girl then you're basically a walk you're walking around as a sin right i can't do this i am if i accidentally show a little wrist or you know like I, my shirt comes up a little bit oh who am i tempting mm-hmm. right and you're walking around with this guilt all the time on the shame all the time and then if something were to happen if you were sexually assaulted or whatever then you're like well it's my fault because yeah. it was me and so basically as as a girl being raised in this environment you i really did feel like oh okay basically i was set up to fail yeah i'm i'm set up to fail i mean it takes it yeah in 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 many ways whether it's a, it's not part of any official teachings again but it's right. culturally set up in this dynamic where the boys almost are given a pass and women take ownership over both right um which is very again a high level of trauma that has to be unwound absolutely for years to come but this is the setup that leads us into our marriages this is the the grounds and and that's that's why i feel like it's so important to discuss because not only do we have the experiences in our home from our our parents but then we have this religious upbringing and experience that goes into it into this programming of uh, you know what you're going to take into this marriage when you're 21 speaking mm-hmm. of by the way the the time from 20 to 30 years old psychologically this is the time where uh you know studies show that you are developing your identity this is right. when you are your most formative time to actually figure out who you are right. and for most mormons you're well into a marriage at that point and you don't even know who you are. No. And your brain's not even done developing yet. No. Finishes at like 25, right? Yeah. And so then you're 25 and you have like two, three, four children, you know, and you're stuck in this marriage. When I say stuck in this marriage, you know, I'm sure there's many, there are many people who have made it work and they have a robust, wonderful marriage as that had a similar experience that got married at 21. Mm-hmm. And that, if that's you, I'm happy for you. The you numbers know? aren't good on that, by the way. The numbers I'm are sure. like... Most, I think the last time Dr. Glenn and I were looking at the statistics, it said something around like, if you marry in your early 20s, it was a 70 to 80% likelihood that you will divorce. Wow. So it's, the number is high, staggering high. And of those that do stay together, we don't have numbers on like, you know, whether they're happy or not. Right. So it's kind of a a matter of time thing. And Mm -hmm. there are some that can figure it out, but you're basically stacking all the odds against you through this cultural you know encouragement of like this young marriage absolutely and it's hard um earlier you said you know something about like values and why you believe in god you know and that's the triangle it's almost that reminded me too of like you get married so quick and you don't actually know the other person's understanding of sex even Mm -hmm. because you could have married somebody who thinks that sex is only for having children yeah and you know because that's a that's, That's a lot. Pr- very common. Mm-hmm. Very common. And so that also means you're missing out on this huge aspect of I mean, When you teach that sex is taboo until you're married and then the goal is to have children. Right. You naturally learn that sex is to have children. Right. So like, yeah, that's one of the purposes, mm-hmm. but it should have also been a tool to get right. closer to the person that you're with. Absolutely. But when you don't, again, you have that like hanging right there, right? For sure. Is it good or bad, right? Oh, it's bad. So wait, it's only good if I have children, but it's bad otherwise and da, da, da. You know, it's very confusing. And so this, the marriage, it's not, it's rocky because it's not based on anything solid here, yeah. right? So fear and then sex is only for procreation. It's kind yeah. of a recipe for disaster, you know? Well, in both of our examples, you know, your own values, mm-hmm. your own identity, your own, uh, your own common interests, your own... The, None of those things were a factor in either of our decisions. No, it right. was just, this is the next step. Right. Find a person who is devout. Right. And now you're married and you go on to the next step in life. Yeah, right. And that's where I found myself as well was right. that, you know, and the other crazy part is that once you are married and you, I was two weeks into my marriage when I started seeing counseling because wow. I knew we had major issues and we almost didn't get married. Uh, we had had a conversation of like, should we go through with this and, and whatnot? And I, and I held to the, well, we prayed about this, so it must be right. Not, not knowing at the time that like, okay, you can pray about something and you know, your, your dick can do a pretty good job of convincing you something's right. If you just want to have sex, you know, right. like you can have feelings that convince you of something. 
yeah. that you manufacture. Mm. But no, we're taught that those feelings are the spirit. So right. I say that this came from God. And so we go through with the marriage. Mm. And two weeks after I'm, I'm going, there's many, many problems. And I'm in counseling. And she wasn't willing to go to counseling. So I'm, I'm doing it by myself. Right. And the man who married me, uh, this is highly unusual for anyone that's not Mormon or doesn't understand this background. Mm -hmm. We were married in the temples, right? Right. The man who married me, who also was uh, my mission president, mm -hmm. was one of the people that I was seeing for just informal counseling. Right. And, uh, and it was four months into the marriage, between four and six months into the marriage, when he said to me in one of these uh, kind of sessions was, this is an unhealthy marriage. You need wow. to get divorced. And at that point, we hadn't even consummated the marriage yet because four months. It was we were six months in before we consummated the marriage. Wow! Because again, for for her, this was it, it was very strange. It was like everything was hot and heavy. We had to hold ourselves off from from having sex before the marriage, right, right. and then all of a sudden, we were married, and now it's like, don't touch me, right? And I and there was never an explanation of why. I thought mm -hmm. maybe there was some form of abuse, maybe mm -hmm. there was something, but it was weird how the flip the the switch just kind of flipped, right? So, you know, my, the man who married us in the temple and you're not supposed to get divorced, let alone the man who marries you in the temple, that, that is so unheard of to yeah. hear. He says you should get divorced. And I, I say, he goes, it's not even a divorce because you haven't consummated the marriage. It's an, it's an annulment. And I go, no, first I don't, you know, I feel like I did this to her. I brought her here and, and we're married. Um, I'm going to fix this. I don't want to be another divorced person in my family. Like my dad was divorced and right. this went way back. And then I don't want to be divorced in, in Utah. That was another factor. So I'm like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to fix this. Wow. But he knew I wouldn't listen to it though. And many people knew, but I wasn't willing to listen to any of them. Right. Cause in my head, this was an answer from God. This was I, when you can't be wrong about something, this is what's terrifying to me is anytime Anytime somebody uses God to justify a decision, yep. there's no place for conversation. There's Absolutely. no place to go mm -hmm. because nothing that I say can trump God right. or your belief in right. that. And I know because I've experienced it myself. Anytime you believe something is Godlike, nobody can convince you otherwise. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly to a less extreme extent, um, it, it is no different than fundamental terrorism mm -hmm. in the Middle East where they teach you to do things in the name of God. If this right. is right to go and, you know, bomb somebody to kill people to do this in the name of God, right. nobody can convince you otherwise. Right. And this is a far less extreme version of that, but it's the Absolutely. same principle. Right. There's no debate there. Right. So to this day, if someone says, I do this because of God, I, I literally walk the other way. Like I can't, I, do, I don't have the conversation because I know where, I, I know where they are. Right. It also really, really, that's a sensitive point for me. And it hurts when people say, God's in control. It's okay. As a form of comfort for me at the moment. Yeah. Because I endured some of the worst pain ever. In God's name. In God's name. I was also just a terrible person. Trying, judging other people, the way that I treated other people, the way that I treated myself, yeah. I would say, is the, probably the most hurtful and disgusting thing mm -hmm. that is very difficult to deal with because I stayed in a marriage like that for so, and I, you know, I'll, I'll get into what I mean by like that, but how am I treating myself by staying in something like that? But I did it in the name of God. Right. Yeah. And so the um, initial reason why I started questioning the church and everything was because after I separated from my ex-husband, I was furious at God. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why did you leave me here? I prayed every single night for some, for some safety, for some peace, for someone, for, for God to show me that he loves me and that I deserve to be happy. And I'm, why am I being punished like this? This isn't like, that was my mindset. And I was like, why did you abandon me in this? Now, a lot of people might say like, well, and I really don't like this answer, by the way. I feel like it's the least empathetic thing you can say to anybody who's mm -hmm. been through anything. It's like, well, that was just a trial. and God wanted to see how strong you are. 
Yeah, you heard of toxic positivity? Absolutely. Oh, it's goodness. the same thing, whether you use God or not, right? It's just like, well, but look at where you are now. You wouldn't be that. You know what? I didn't need to be abused to be the person that I am today. You know, like we can't just wrap everything up in a, well, God wanted that to happen. Like this is just not a sufficient answer for me anymore because I was in a great deal of pain and you can't, and I was waiting on God to help me. That's the other thing is like, you're sort of, if you were so sure that God was telling you, no, don't, don't get, don't get divorced. Right. Like you have the feeling and everything. Then, um, then you're also like waiting for God to save you. Then I'm waiting yeah. for the next signal. I'm maybe waiting for the next sign and it never comes. That's my biggest issue with it. My, my biggest issue is that that belief is disempowering. Right. If totally, if, if it's, the universe, whether it's God or the universe or fate, it doesn't matter what higher power you use or believe in. If it's that higher power acting upon you, mm -hmm. then you have no control in the situation. Right. So you just wait. And at the same time, that's also very convenient and very, um, it was almost nice actually to not be able to make decisions for myself because I've been trained not to, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like when you are raised in a um, culture like that, you really are, you forget who you are. So it's almost easier to just have somebody tell you what to do by then. And, oh, for sure. and that pl played a huge role in my marriage also, where I just never <laughs> stood up for myself. I never, I chose not to have an opinion because it was just easier if he got to choose. I I'd like and, you to actually go yeah. into that. Can you share sure. what the marriage was like? So what were some of these how did it start? How did it go? At what point did you start realizing the issues? What, what was that like? Okay. So right off the bat, um, you said two weeks into your marriage, you were in counseling. Yeah. It was about a month after we got married that I, something just felt wrong yeah. for me. And it was a, it was a very scary moment for me. Like, and I think largely it was because no one really tells you when you're, or in the church, what does happen after marriage? Like, mm -hmm. how are you supposed to make things work? How do you communicate? How do you keep this? But aside from just pray together and go yeah. to the temple, right? And so I didn't really have any tools to figure out or communicate or anything. I just thought, oh, this is happily ever after. This is it. Mm -hmm. And so about a month after, um, we sort of had this incident. I won't get into too much detail, but he seemed very upset about something and I couldn't, and I, there was no reason why. And I was, kept, I kept being like, Oh, is it me? Is it like, what is it? Like, let's fix it. And he was just angry and I was terrified and I had no idea why any of it was happening, but I was like, wait, something just feels very, very wrong here. Yeah. Um, till this day. And then in that, uh, when that happened, he blamed me and he was like, when I responded in a way that was like, why are you, why are you being angry at me? I don't understand this. And then he's like, well, why are you, you know? And then that's when it started where I was like, oh, everything's my fault. Right. Well, and now I mean, we go back to that programming. Right? right. So all the programming starts to take hold and right. well, it must be the decisions that I'm making that are. Exactly. And I mean, same thing, you know, how I talked earlier about shame as being raised Mormon. It's like, okay, well it is my fault then. Okay. It's my fault. So from that moment on, I started survival mode right mm -hmm. there. I mean, I was 21 years old. I thought, okay, we still have to have children because that's what we're supposed to do. But inside, I was already ready to be like, just don't make him mad. Right? Like, and he was quick to anger. I guess I'll, I'll put mm -hmm. it that way. He was just a very um, angry person. Mm -hmm. And so our marriage dynamic was more, how do I keep you from not being mad at me instead of like, how do we nourish our marriage and our love so that we grow closer together? It was more, so I'm here in my um, existence. It's just to make sure that you don't yeah. get mad at me and that if you do get mad, it's not my fault. And then, but it probably is anyway. So how do I make things better? And yeah, you're in survival mode. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure. So we had, then we had kids, we had three kids in four years. So that was really quick. But we, um, I actually, I'm admitting this on your, on your podcast, but I actually, <laughs> I've admitted a lot of things. On podcast, so <laughs> That's worry. why people listen. They're like, Ooh, <laughs> let's Juicy. learn. Get the yeah, exactly. Um, in 2011, um, 
So this is five years into our marriage was the first time that I thought, if you are this unhappy being married to me, like all the time, you are not super helpful with the kids, right? You were, you, he, at one point he just wasn't like I was doing everything. Um, and you just look angry and you're mad at me all the time. Why are we still married? Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't, I didn't officially get divorced until three years ago. Mm -hmm. So that was a long time for me after the first realization that like, why don't you just divorce me then? And it yeah. was almost like I was waiting for him to divorce me, not me, because I didn't think I had a voice, right? You're, you're a woman in the Mormon church that's married. And I was just so fearful of divorce, right? Mm -hmm. How that would make me look like what people will say about me. Oh, this is bad. I'm breaking a union that we have with God. Like there are so many reasons I can't get divorced, but at the same time, I was normalizing all of the different ways that he was treating me as if that's just acceptable well, in the, a relationship. The environment that we're in too, it doesn't, we talked about this, it doesn't go into any specifics. There's no actual tools. There's no nothing right. beyond people going up each week and sharing their experience of, right. you know, uh, sometimes marriage is hard and right. you need to pray through it. You pray through it and find your answers. Just these very the vague generalities of like, and then other times, you know, people go up and their marriage is horrible, but they'll go up and say how grateful they are for their husband. And right. I'm so grateful. And they'll, they'll play out this like convincing game publicly. Right. They're really trying to convince themselves, but Absolutely. for everybody else, we just think, oh man, they're, you know, they're, what a great couple. And right. So there's really no, and I'll, I'm willing to bet that you didn't talk to anybody about this. No, I did not. Because, because like, I was lying to myself too. Yeah. And then with, with social media, so I started like mommy blogging and social media, all the posts that I had were all lies. Yeah. Because I needed to be the same like. Thing, grateful for this and yeah. grateful for that. And and when you are, you know, I've heard a lot of people say this about the church where they say we are a hospital, not a sh showroom or whatever. I can't remember the exact uh, yeah. sentence, but they were like, oh, no, church is not where you come to display how good you are. It is where you come and lay your. Um, troubles down and G let Jesus carry them for you. You know, that type of thing. And I'm like, you guys are all saying this. And yet when we come here, everybody is talking about how wonderful it's their life is and how hospital, right? If it were, it would actually do what it's supposed to do. Right. But when you, when you, it's, it, it's kind of a weird experience because they're, you're blatantly not experiencing it as a hospital. You're like, okay, well, you guys need to get dressed. You need, I, do you know how often I got mad at my kids for not looking perfect for going to church? Because oh, yeah. I'm like, well, all the families need to look perfect. We're going to be late. And, you know, you take, I can't, I look back and I think, wow, I am so, I am, I feel so bad for the way I even treated my kids. Why are you yelling at your kids over them for getting crayons or for making a peep at church? They're children. Let them peep. Right. Let them speak. Let them. They're children. They shouldn't have to be quiet for three hours straight and sit mm -hmm. in a chair. And like all of that is just developmentally also inappropriate, which I, I'll talk about that later, you know, with yeah. like how I talk about children and things like that. But it wasn't developmentally appropriate. And then we're over here yelling at them like we're here for God. Yeah. I mean, do you know how confusing that is for a child? It's like, oh, yeah, God loves me. If I sit still, if I don't say anything, if I say a prayer if I read my scriptures, like that's the only way I get love is if I am absolutely obedient. And that's when it starts is when they're, when, when you're that little mm -hmm. anyway. So going back to the marriage, the problem with, it was a huge internal conflict for me in 2011, because part of me was like, something feels wrong and I am miserable. I am so unhappy, but I'm going to Toxic pos I'm going to put on a show and I'm going to toxic positivity out of this. The My biggest fan of my show at the time was myself, mm -hmm. right? Because I was like, wow, I'm doing a really good job holding it together, right? Like as if me holding it together was faith, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh yeah, I can, I can power through this. And then until what? Until I die? So I'm going to keep putting on this show and just be accept that I'll never be happy until I die. And then God will bless you with all the greatest things, right? Like, this is your, this is your trial. So keep at it, Amanda. You're doing great. And so that was really, really, it was the most lonesome experience for me to be married and to feel absolutely alone. It's yeah. much better to be alone and feel alone than it is to have somebody who promised that they would love you and you promised God. You guys... I mean, it, they didn't just promise you, they promised God 
that they would love you and take care of you when you feel absolutely alone. You're reading my mind right now. I literally wrote a post two days ago. It's in the shorts <laughs> that we all ignore a very simple but ugly truth mm -hmm. that it's better to actually be alone than to be alone in a marriage. Yeah. Those are or, yeah. two distinctly different things. And absolutely the latter is so much worse. Right. And you know, by then it was also like, like you know, I don't, when it comes to communicating in, in, within a relationship, it's like you have to ask for what you need. But there's one big problem with asking for what you need is when you don't feel like you sh are allowed to ask for what you need. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, sure, ask for what you need. That's how you can't read each other's minds. This is all absolutely true. But if I'm living in fear that you're going to get mad at me, I'm not going to ask you for a single thing because you're going to reject me and that hurts, right? And then you're going to just prove to me that like this is your fear right you're going to prove to me that i was right that i'm not deserving of anything good right mm -hmm. that there's something wrong with me i'm not being obedient enough i'm not reading my scriptures enough i'm not praying enough so my husband doesn't love me mm -hmm. right like and so there is that's kind of where i was stuck where i was like if i ask him i'm a burden on him i'm an inconvenience and he's already angry and whatnot so i'm just gonna right when you're in survival mode you're not exactly like hey i really want to talk no you're just like, I'm going to make sure that the house is completely clean. So you have nothing to complain about. There's no reason for you to be upset, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's where I was from 2011 on S just straight survival mode. So his anger was a constant issue then. Constant. And, um, outside of that. So at, at points, did you ever feel like there was, you know, were you fearing for yourself physically as well? You know, no, I, um, I can be very honest, not until close to the end, okay. um, uh, but he was very unhappy about things. And the, the difference with being just angry and being angry, but never wrong. That's the huge part yeah. where you could just be angry, but then it follows with, I mean, sorry, I didn't just give permission for people to just lash out if you're angry, but I'm saying there's anger and then he admits that he's wrong and then we make change and da, 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 da. You go on this roller coaster word. Oh, absolutely. And, but with him, he was never wrong. So why do I bring, why would I bring anything up? Why would I ask for anything if I'm always wrong? Yeah. You know, like if I remember one, I'll give one short, ex, one short example, but right after I had my daughter, I um, was gung ho about making friends and maybe going back to the gym. You know, you just have all these, uh, I wasn't feeling great about myself. I just had a baby, you know, and I, I just really kind of wanted some me time. And I had made arrangements with a friend to go to a gym. And I had told him and I said, hey, I am going to the gym at this time. So I need you to come home to make sure that I can make it to the gym at this time. And it was like 8 p.m. or something. It wasn't even, hey, can you miss work or yeah. miss school? He was in school at the time. Um, it wasn't a big ask, I don't think, you know, like 8 p.m., come back so you can be here while the kids are sleeping. The kids weren't even awake. It wasn't even like, come watch the kids. It was just come sit in the house, you know, and then so I can go to the gym so I can have 30 minutes to myself after taking care of everything and everyone for the last however long. And um, he didn't make it back on time for whatever reason. And I was so angry. I wanted to go to sleep because I wanted to avoid him because I Sure. Uh, there is that internal conflict. I'm so angry and I want to tell you why I'm angry, but I'm so afraid of you yeah. because if you get angry, you're not going to talk to me for three days. And so I don't know what to do, but he walked in as I was going to bed and I was angry and he's like, why are you angry? Like he's yelling at me and I'm like, well, I, I, you, um, I, I told you I wanted to go to the, just for 30 minutes. I wanted to go to the gym. Like I'm scared. Yeah. Right. And he's just like, do you know how hard I work? Do you know how hard I work at school and you have, you're just going to stand here and tell me that you're mad at me. He's like, this is ridiculous. And you always take so long at the gym. So I can't even go. And so you're describing, I mean, I rely on Dr. Glenn for official diagnoses, but right. you're describing several different personality disorders. Right. I mean, this is like yep. severe mental health going from right. narcissism to BPD. Right. To there's a lot of stuff going on. Absolutely. And at the time, of course, I'm like, this is normal. Mm -hmm. This is normal. This is my fault. And I will, and I will tell you, I made a connection myself a couple of years ago 
that the reason, one of the biggest reasons why, and people might call this far-fetched, but one of the biggest reasons why I accepted that as normal behavior is because I was so used to being blamed for every single thing that went wrong in my life because of my religious upbringing. Yeah. So you accept it. Like I was just like, oh yeah, of course it's my fault. That makes sense. It's my fault. And so I, again, then you learn, right? Okay. Don't ask to go to the gym. Don't do this. Don't do anything for yourself because you're, you wanting to have time for yourself is an inconvenience to him. Again, survival mode, right? So we just do everything that he, whatever can keep him happy, then I, I will do you because know that makes the, me a good wife. One of the key markers of uh, the healthy person mm. in an unhealthy relationship mm. is the one who stays quiet. Mm. So it's wow. a very easy indicator of like who's the one that's actually healthy and and doing good right. because and the funny thing is that the other person will make it seem the other person's generally like going to be pretty good at manipulating they could be right. narcissistic they could have bipolar they could be you know borderline personality disorder mm -hmm. but they're going to say things that make it seem like it's the other person's problem and and the other person generally just going to stay quiet throughout right. it. Uh, and they're really good at convincing people. They're really good at, you know, their words and manipulation. And You know, what's interesting, too, is I'm actually I just had a moment where I thought if he ever heard this, mm -hmm. watched this, heard this podcast, he would be like, she's insane. That never happened. You know, like I'm yeah. already thinking that's exactly what he's going to say. And he's going to somehow twist it in his mind. And that is his reality, too. That's what's really, really scary. It's it's his reality was that. I was wrong the entire time we were married. Yeah. That it's I a was the one personality disorder. Yeah. And and the other thing about that is is not only is the healthy person quiet, but the healthy person generally tries to understand the other right. person's perspective, which is impossible because mm -hmm. you're trying to use your value set right. to understand the things that he's doing. Right. And there is it, it's like an you know, Apple trying to explain why an orange is the way it is. It, it's like it doesn't Nothing computes. Right. But you can spend a lot of your energy just simply trying to understand it. Mm -hmm. And there is no understanding. Right. Absolutely. And that, I think, you know, I am, you want to talk about toxic positivity, right? So I definitely was painted this idea in my brain that everything is fine. Everything is good for so long until my body almost was like, hey, if you're not going to listen to me, I'm going to make you listen. That's the final step. Final step. Physical, like your body just shuts down. Mm -hmm. You get sick or whatever. And what happened with us is I passed out in a in an airport when we were flying back from another country. And I just blacked out. Nobody knew. I couldn't explain it. Nobody knew why. But I blacked out. And um, I was wheeled into like the infirmary type thing in the airport. And... He came in and I remember this moment, um, I'm lying there and I'm just confused and I'm feeling all these, what just happened? And I'm worried about the kids because we got to fly back and all this stuff. And he looks at me and the look in his eyes was irritation. Mm -hmm. So his wife had just blacked out for no reason and he has inside of an airport you. and he's mad at me. He said, you okay? Like mm -hmm. that. And I was like, uh-huh. And he said, you think we're going to get on this flight or what? Because if you throw up, they're not going to let us get on this flight. Wow. And I started bawling. I, well, I waited for him to leave the room. And then I started bawling. And I was like, why doesn't he love me? Like that's, that is the, there's so many times in our marriage that I thought, hey, if I could just get, if I could just get into an accident, maybe he'll love me and realize, oh, I was close to losing her. Like I actually fantasized about those things because I was trying to understand why he didn't love me anymore. What was it me? Was it because I didn't lose the baby weight fast enough? Is it because well, like, what is it? Dinner wasn't good. Like that was my entire marriage trying to figure out where I went wrong and why he didn't love me. And so at that Again, point, your programming of right. taking responsibility for exactly. And also because the programming plus his, you know, he confirmed that programming for, for me sure. because of the way that he's a he treated it. Right. He's, he's going to confirm it. Exactly. And so for me, I was like, wow, what did I do wrong? What, why, why, why did I deserve this? What, what am I, how do I fix this? And so that's where my mind was. You know, my body, I just passed out. My body is like, you know what, enough. 
it's over. And I was already like, okay, how do I make him happy in the next moment? Because 10 minutes after I was like, okay, I'm fine. We go to the gate. He asked me to go buy him something to eat. <laughs> and then it wasn't warm enough. So I had to go back and ask them to warm it back up. This is wild. That's crazy. And the the body is the the last indicator. We we talked about signs of an unhealthy relationship, and right. it's all the things that you've mentioned. But you stick with it, you will start getting sick more. Absolutely. Your immune response goes down, yep. and eventually you start having critical failures, blackouts. Yes. You start yep. having, and you know, I what if I told you I did that for seven years? I was reading it. Wow. I was reading it in books that your immune response would drop in an unhealthy relationship. Right. That, and I would, as I would read it, I would go, "Man, it's a good thing that I don't have an unhealthy relationship." Wow. The, this was like I, I had questioned divorce hundreds of times, wow. and I was still unwilling to accept it. I was right. still un, no, I'm going to push through this. I'm going to power through it. Mm -hmm. So it kept going, and I would get, I would be sick. You know, at first it was every couple months and then it was every month and then it was every other week. Mm -hmm. Always not feeling good. Right. Um, by the time that I divorced, that was when I was uh, to the point where I was like contemplating suicide. And, I, wow. and then I started thinking, wait, that's kind of insane that I would consider killing myself because I'm in, I'm in an unhappy marriage. Wow. And uh, it was it was this slow buildup of like every week. I would come home and try to work through this marriage and try to figure things out and read and study and meet with counselors. And then I'd go out on a weekend and photograph a wedding. Mm. And then I would have the chance to see real love sometimes. And then I would be so grateful to be able to see it and then think to myself, it's so wonderful being married. And on the drive home, realize that I don't have that. But then continue the process of like trying to build it again and then going through this. But I, I did that for... Seven years until ultimately it was questioning divorce for the first seven years of my marriage, then actually being willing to do it. Wow. Meeting with a bishop. See, it, it goes both ways, this blame thing. Because mm -hmm. the bishop then told me, he, he pulled my wife in. Then they both tagged, like tag team. So I, they invited me in and the bishop goes, um, Elder, this is all your fault. Wow. Your lack of connection with your wife is your fault. Wow. Until you address your own problems and your own issues. <sighs> no. And he's not a marital counselor. He's not. No. I've, I've met with plenty of professionals. and But, you know, again, if you believe in God and that this is God's plan, then mm -hmm. the bishop must be speaking the truth. He's not, he's not just a man who could be wrong. Right. He's speaking for God. So then at the seven-year mark, I think, okay, I'm going to double down and just keep going at it. So I was ready to divorce I was ready to pull the trigger once, seven years in, and then right after that, oh, and the solution that they both gave was uh, the way to fix your marriage is to have children. And I was wow. terrified to have kids because I thought, I don't want to bring kids into this. So the whole time I just didn't want to have kids. Um, but they convinced me. Right. And a year later, our first son was born. And that was the, our, our, our son and daughter were the two best things we ever did. The only good things that we ever did. Um. But for a time, they distracted me because it got busy. Right. So now I'm just, again, you're in survival mode. Yeah. And we don't differentiate the difference between resilience and mental health. We oh, all have the gosh. ability to be resilient, right? Yes. That is that is an, a survival ability that we yeah. all intrinsically, that's why we're here. Yes. Because we can deal with emergencies. We can go from one fire to the next. But there's a big difference between being resilient and being mentally healthy. Those are right. not the same thing. Mm. But we think they are. I have so much to say on that. I'm going to let you keep going. Well, yeah, <laughs> because, we think no, because, are. you know, we just had this pandemic and everybody's like, children are so resilient. And I'm like, mm, we need to stop calling them. That. There's but anyway, difference. there's an absolute difference between resilience and mental health. But anyway, continue with your story. Actually, I had a question for you, yeah. if that's OK. I wanted to know, I heard something that you said that was very intriguing to me. You said that you would go and photograph weddings and that you would sometimes see real love. And I would love if you could describe that for me and how you could see that so hope that's not too 10 years topic. ago no mm -hmm. because it's kind of what led to this and, and right. i've described this before a few times but 10 years ago my my marriage so when i was 21 i began the process of going to counseling and then right. reading books and i would read every single book that i could get and when i became a wedding photographer that was like 12 years ago 13 years ago i realized that this might be a really great place to start gathering data mm -hmm. on like I've read a lot. I'm not a, a 
formally trained psychologist, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an informally trained one. Mm -hmm. uh, so why don't I start collecting my own data points on this? Right. So I would just start taking notes uh, after each wedding, mm. after each client, after each. I would see their, them interact with their friends, them interact with their parents. I would see people, you know, each of these. So the camera was kind of this passport into this other people's lives and they would just behave normally. Right. So I would just write down things, you know, like simple things. Uh, when we walk out to a steep and rocky location, does the person in front actually look back to see if the other person's okay? Mm. Uh, when we're out, you know, and one person notices something interesting, does the other person engage or are they distracted and thinking of other things? And soon enough, I, I had all these different data points. And what I would recognize is that sometimes when you're at a wedding, uh, you would see genuine love. And what it looked like was two people that were on a very similar wavelength. So like the way that each of them would communicate with their friends and family was similar. The way that they would relate and see the world was similar. Mm -hmm. When they would talk to each other, you would see them actually connecting and looking for points where they could listen, but then also engage. And so there was a, a certain presence about them where you could tell that there was a, it, it, the best way to describe it was on the same wavelength. Okay. They were connected, you know, and each time I would go home, you would, I would quickly see like, there is no engagement, there is no connection. And so I kept plotting these data points, mm. but it got to the point where I was incredibly depressed because it was proof right. of, so I just kept, I had 500 over 500 of these case studies by the time I started putting together this framework that led to this. Right. Um, but anyway, the next time that I would be strong enough to actually go through with it would be seven years later. Wow. And in that time, I would have, my, my gallbladder would fail. So like right towards the end oh when God. I was dealing with like the worst of it, uh, I almost died because I had a infected gallbladder. Wow. And it was something that I had for the last two years of my marriage. And at each time that I would say like, oh my God, I would be doubled over in pain, clutching my side. And my ex would say, you're fine, just drink some soup. And then I would go, you know, photograph a wedding for 14 hours. Oh and like my goodness. Doubled over pain. And right. I did that for two years. Wow. And it was finally when I was single, this was six months after the fact, after I'd already separated, I was single and uh, my ex had just dropped off the kids for on Friday. And, uh, I usually like to take them out and do things. Mm -hmm. Well, Friday, I'm, I'm I can't move. Like I'm just incapacitated and I'm on painkillers. And my kids just I know we do something, but just put on a movie, and they're worried. And I'm like I'll be fine. I just need to sleep it off. Saturday, I wake up and I'm I'm dating Yen at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, Saturday, I wake up and it's still there. I, and like I could barely sleep, but fall asleep at random times. And, right. But Saturday, it's still there. And uh, I call Yen and I tell her like I can't move I, I'm, I'm doubled over and she's like if you don't go to the emergency room right now I'm gonna take you I'm like no it's not that big of a deal she's like wow. you go to the emergency room or we're done I'm not I'm not gonna and we just barely started dating mm -hmm. and uh <clears throat> I remember calling my ex and I, I said can you come pick up the kids I need to go to the emergency room and she said no I'm busy but you can drop them off if you want now my ex doesn't work or do anything really um and I'm, I'm not trying to be mean when i say that I'm like literally she does not have a job and she was just home mm -hmm. um so i drove my kids like like in pain holding my stomach i wow. drove the kids home and then i drove myself to the emergency room and that's when the doctor said uh she goes <laughs> i got the i think it was a ultrasound that they did in an x-ray and ultrasound one of those she comes in and goes uh your gallbladder is infected and needs to be removed immediately and i'm like okay i'm going to india in like you know a week i'll just do it when i get back and she goes no you leave the hospital and you're not coming back she goes well, i've already scheduled the emergency room uh the surgery room and and you're going into surgery in 30 minutes wow. and i was like oh okay um, let me just make a call. And she's like, you're taking this really well. And at this point I've, I was kind of already very little phased me at that point anymore mm. in life. So I looked Thanks. at this doctor and I'm like, I've been through a lot, doc. I'm good. If I die on that table, it's okay. If I keep living, that's great too. Wow. Do your best. And she was looking at me like I was psycho. Right. And I called Yen and, and I was like, I'm, I'm going to go into surgery now. Uh, you know, don't feel like you need to come. We just 
you know, started dating and whatnot. And I was, at the time I was six months separated. I really didn't know where my relationship with the end was going. It was mm-hmm. kind of just taking it slow. And anyway, that was the experience. But I had full on examples of complete failures in my, in my body, my right. mind, everything. It took to that place to like, I mean, yeah. to make the decision to, to suddenly push back. Right. Absolutely. That is, so I was reading that, you know, when your body is in fight or flight for so long, right? That is how physically your, bo- your the rest of your body gets sick so easily is because your nervous system is running on an all-time high all the time. Yeah. You know, so post-separation and I was still just all-time high, you know, just it takes a long time. I would say I'm still in the process of healing and really connecting with myself, you know, and recovering from all of that 12 years in, three years out. So, I mean, it's going to take time, but it is amazing what your body endures physically when you are mentally being hurt or there's this, you know. For sure. This damage being done. You want to know what's funny is since my separation, like the literally the moment that I was separated, Mm -hmm. I stopped getting sick. Wow. And it was so clearly evident because it went from like, you know, 20, 30 sick days a year to zero. Wow. And now it's like I I rarely if I feel something, it's like a cold for a couple days Mm -hmm. and I'm done with it. Right. And this isn't to make light of COVID by any means, but the kids got COVID two weeks ago, right? Mm-hmm. And they bring it home. And Yen goes, we're all going to get this. And I'm like, that's fine. We're, you're healthy. You know, you're vaccinated. I feel like I'm healthy. And, and I made a joke of this. I go, honey, my immune system has been through like 14 years of fucking Spartan races. Right. Like, I think I have the strongest... <laughs> I got the David Goggins of immune systems. <laughs> right. right. This is, I'm, I'm going to be fine. Right. And not to make light of anything, no, but the whole no, house no. got COVID. And I stayed negative throughout the entire two week period. And I was kissing my kids. I was like hanging out with mm-hmm. them. And, you know, I am vaccinated, by the way. Just, I don't want to like cause any. But I, I genuinely believe that like that my immune system has literally been trained over 14 years of mm-hmm. like, you know, constantly dealing with stuff. And now it's like, okay. So I, I had a couple days. That the only thing that I felt was like I would fatigue early. Uh, when when the whole house had COVID, I would fatigue early during a workout. So I would right. go and do my workout. I was like, man, I'm getting tired a little bit earlier than normal. Um, each time I felt it, the next day I would be sore and I'd be like, I bet I got COVID. I would mm-hmm. go take my PCR test, negative. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> I'd go to Kaiser. I'm like, maybe the home one doesn't work. Negative. Mm-hmm. I did my test five times in the period. Whoa. I was negative the whole time. <laughs> wow. And I'm, I'm going, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure like I got the David Goggins of immune systems. <laughs> I, I, that's one, another, the third positive thing to come from right. my marriage. Well, I was going to say too, I know we'll talk about this later, but like do- dating post divorce. It's so funny because that reminds me of how when I've, I have been dating, um, but if something doesn't work out, I'm just like, <laughs> you can't hurt me. You know, like it's almost like you could do anything really. I mean, you can't hurt me because I've already been to hell and back. So, you know, okay, cool. You don't want to, you want to ghost me? That is the title of his book, right? You can't hurt me. David Goggins book. Oh, it's (laughs) It's called, you can't hurt me. I thought, I thought maybe you. Oh no. But yeah, we can pretend I totally made that reference. No. Uh, yeah, I, I really, I, I thought that I was like, When people talk about like, oh, ghosting hurts so much, which I've actually never been ghosted, which maybe it does hurt a lot, but you know. um, It doesn't. You'll be fine. Okay. (laughs) Wait, let's not put that in the universe that I'm going to get ghosted. It's only a matter of time if you're dating. No, I know, I know. But um, no, it's just like, oh, he doesn't want to date you. Great. You know, it's like you really, yeah, there's not much. I yeah. mean, I still have feelings, obviously, like in my full range of emo- emotions, but it's just in contrast to what I have experienced in my marriage and post-divorce. I'm like, there's not much that, uh, not much that can happen that will hurt. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. And I guess if, if there was a takeaway that I would want our listeners to have would be like, you, you gotta trust your gut and, oh, and, and kind of just 
don't endure this much pain. It's it's really unfortunate because if this were any other relationship, if it was family, if it was a friendship, if it was, you know, business partnership, if it was everybody would exit so much. Like you you realize the toxicity of it, you're done. You don't yeah. you don't stick around for that. Yeah. But because of all these different pieces of programming, social programming, religious programming, you know, our own upbringings, you stay in this toxic marriage that is literally killing you for far too long. Absolutely. And I think sometimes if you are even wondering, am I in a toxic relationship or if you Googled something, then it's time to t really take a look. And I have, you know, for your, for your listeners who might be wondering, oh, could that be me? Is this toxic? Because mm -hmm. when you're in it, you're pretty confused, regardless of what programming or upbringing you have. I know why I was confused. I was completely lost. I didn't know, I had no idea who I was, but there, other people can be confused or miss signs or be tolerating a lot more than we should be mm -hmm. for different reasons. And regardless of the reasons, um, this is something that I actually recommend to my clients, which is to actually take a video of yourself talking about what's going on in your life and then watch it back mm -hmm. because sometimes we're able to hold space for other people. It's like when I, if you tell me a story like that, I'm like, Oh yeah, that doesn't sound right. You, we can always do that with friends, but with ourselves, we justify everything, right? We're just for like, sure. Oh, because we are ourselves, we're too close. And so if you are even considering or wondering if something is wrong, find a private space, take your phone, make sure that you're looking at yourself, record yourself, just talking about your life let it sit for a moment, watch it back to yourself as if you're, it's a friend telling you something about what's going on in their lives. And then if that was your best friend, if that was your sister, if that was a, react as if that was somebody that you love and then listen to it. Because sometimes I will talk about my story and my experiences and I would be like, wow, I am, I've endured a lot, mm -hmm. but you sort of don't, you know, other people are like, wow, I can't believe you did did that. That's wild. How did you endure that for so long? But when you're when it's you, you're kind of like, yeah, well, I just kind of powered through it. Right. But when you actually look back at what you're experiencing, it's actually quite shocking because sure. then when you have that space to listen to yourself and to look into your own eyes, you can see pain and you can see all of these things that you may not have known were there yeah. before. That's a that's a really great tool. Do you remember the the tool that I shared with you a few years back when you were there were many tools. <laughs> I, I you were like my just, personal therapist for a while too. The one thing, it's so hard to demonstrate self-care when you're in that situation because mm -hmm. you feel like you're in that situation, number one, because you've been, you, 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 you please, you, right. you've been put into the people pleaser role because that's a survival role. Mm -hmm. And so it's so difficult because this decision feels so inherently selfish. Right. Um, and the one that I share with everybody that we share with clients is, you know, uh, Imagine that your son or daughter is in this exact mm. same marriage mm -hmm. and they come and they tell you everything that you've experienced. Right. What would you tell them? Right. And I remember when I asked you that question, you said, like, I, I wasn't even done with the question. You said, get out. Yeah. I was like, okay. So you love your kids enough to encourage them to right. be done. Can you love yourself enough to do the same? Right. Um, but it's a difficult thing, like, to... to the divorce process, which was probably for another time, but that that's a difficult process. And to make the decision to, you, you really have to be ready and move forward. And it's not as if to say like, you shouldn't see that's, I think the confusing thing is that oftentimes people just take a read of like, oh yeah, if I notice one thing of like bad behavior, toxicity, mm. I'm done and I'm out. Mm -hmm. No, like you, you put your effort into the marriage. Marriages do require work and they require right. effort. But the, the key sign of like whether effort is going to make a difference is whether both people are committed to making the effort. Right. If both people are committed to making the effort and they're, you know, you're each working towards a mutual goal, you stay, you work. Right. right. But if one person is making the effort and the other person categorically, historically is not willing to do that, nothing is going to change. No. So you're either going to lose yourself in the process. Right. Or at some point you're going to have a critical breakdown and right. you'll be forced to choose yourself right. and to say, it's either I, I go and survive or I stay and die. Right. Whether it's dying slowly or quickly, you, you make the call. Right. Absolutely. But yeah, that's. It is, it is um, difficult actually to fight for yourself sometimes when you're, when you're in that. 
You know, like that, that is why the divorce process, this is also why people will be like, yeah, but if it was that bad, why didn't you get out sooner? Yeah. Right. Like everybody, you, says, everybody that. says that, right. Uh, you know, also, first of all, super not an epi- good epi- no, <laughs> not epi- epi- thing to say when your friend says something like, oh yeah, but did he hit you? You know, like as if, as if that's the only reason, that's the only reason why. And I wanted to be like, no, I kind of wish that he did. So I would have woken up a little <laughs> sooner. Yeah. You know what I mean? If that's the only thing that like counts as a bad enough scenario to leave, then maybe that's what I should have done is provoked that, you know, because you know, nobody wants to believe that, you know, anything else is <clears throat> abuse. But From a, a coaching and, and, and therapy standpoint, hmm. it's easier to help people overcome an instance of physical abuse, not, not like years of physical right. abuse, but if there is that one moment that just that happened and you're out, it's far easier to help someone to overcome that than it is to overcome years of emotional abuse. Years of emotional abuse, it takes a long time to unwind. Right. And it's wild how those two things, like it, it's weird that we think that, oh, did he did he hit you? Did Was there physical mm-hmm. abuse? Like as if that's the, that's actually the less damaging version of what's mm-hmm. going on, you know? Mm-hmm. Have you read the book, The Body Keeps Score? No. You should, you should read that book. It really does. It's excellent, by the way. And it talks about how, you know, well, they, I think they coined a new term, complex PTSD, right? Mm. Where, where it is where you've endured mental and emotional abuse for so long and how similar it is to somebody who has seen who has like a vet, a veteran who has seen some stuff. That we've actually war. talked about on the podcast. Oh, because yeah, Dr. Yeah. Glenn did a brain scan at one point. Wow. And his doctor said this brain scan mm-hmm. is identical to someone who has just come right. back from war. Exactly. And so he got into the studies of that. Right. So yeah, that, bu- that book talk. Book. Excellent. And super well written too. I'm not going to call it a quick read because for me, I had to go back and be like, oh, that's so, so me. You know, maybe one day when I read it, it'll be a quick read. <laughs> but at the moment I'm like, oh yeah, that happened to me and you know, and all that stuff. And so yeah, excellent read. And you know, for anyone who has experienced this, um, I also had, you know, again, I'm three years out but Mm. I still have triggers like left and right. And some of them just creep up on you and you have no idea and you're coiled up in a corner and you're crying. And I don't, I didn't mean to chuckle at that because it's a very serious thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it just, you know, um, and those things are very, it's, it's a lot to, it's very heavy and it's a lot to deal with. And sometimes I think that again, we have to be on our own team here, right? For the first time in your life, we have to choose to be on our own team and actually love ourselves enough to stand up for ourselves and have the courage to go through this healing and all and face all the things that have just happened. You yeah. know, we are in this culture and the society and then the religion, all of that together. We always put ourselves last, you know, like uh, being raised in the church. We talk about how you love, love other people first. Nobody ever talks about how you have, you're supposed to, it's almost selfish, right? And mm-hmm. prideful. It's prideful for you to love yourself. But, for the first time in my life, I had to get to know who I am, find out who I am so that I can love myself and stand up for myself and finally choose to exit a very, very bad relationship instead of being like, oh, yeah, but, you know, that one time, that one year, he, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that one, he didn't seem that bad that one time, you know, and you sort of justify all of these things, but you really do have to go to bat for yourself. When really the the intention there also has to be that because you love yourself, right? And that's a really hard thing for most people to do. Do you ever find that ironic given that, you know, we're both, we both came up in Mormonism is a form of Christianity. Mm-hmm. So you're studying Jesus Christ. So is it not ironic because Jesus Christ did actually gain his own sense of identity. He mm. did his own work. He right? did his own self-care. He even told people in many instances, don't bother me. I'm having a conversation with my father type you know, thing. Mm-hmm. He told his own dad that. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm speaking to my wow. heavenly father. He gained his own spirituality, gained his own everything mm-hmm. before serving others. Right. Is that not ironic? So that ironic. We flip the script and say that no, others come first. Right. When literally your figurehead gave you the example serve yourself then serve others right it's it is there's this like fine balance right because you you were talking about how you know i play the piano right so at church i was allowed to i play the piano and i would perform anytime anybody needed somebody to play the piano i would do it because Mm -hmm. that's not i mean 
it's not something, it's not a skill you can pray for, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> like, oh yeah, we need to we need to ask someone to play the piano, piano, but they don't know how to play the piano, but it's okay. Like I prayed for that once. <laughs> how with did that a work out story. for you? <laughs> um, so I would play the piano, but then afterwards it would be like, you should be so grateful to God that He gave you those fingers and that talent, and that you know you need to stay humble though. You know, this is what I told myself as a young kid is like, I can't be good. I can't be great because I know what happens when you become prideful. So there's this balance between I love myself and I'm proud of who I am. And then, but I could never feel that because the second I felt proud of myself, I was like, oh no, I'm sinning. Mm -hmm. I can't be proud of myself. God doesn't want me to be proud of myself because he gave me these fingers and he gave me piano lessons and he gave me this piano and he gave me this family so that I could afford piano lessons. You know what I mean? And so when you're constantly trying to convince yourself that you're not worth anything, fast forward into adulthood and you're trying to make decisions about a marriage, a divorce or anything, you're talking yourself down the entire time, right? Like I'm not worth anything. I'm not, I'm not good. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes total sense. sense. I mean, if I were to share one last piece, it, 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 I was firm in my decision to get divorced when I was 34. Mm. And what made me firm in that decision was I decided that, at least for myself, I knew who God was. Mm -hmm. God was a loving parent, mother or father, doesn't matter, a loving parent who wants his children to learn and to grow and to have experiences. And, And I thought, you know, God for me represents the perfect parent. He or she is the perfect father or mother. And they want the best for their children. And the best is oftentimes learning experiences and growth and, and all these different things right. that might not be enjoyable, but they are necessary. Mm-hmm. Right. But I thought if God represents the best of us, you know, weak parents, and I would never want my kids to go through what I did, then I'm pretty sure that God wouldn't want me to go through the things that we're going through right now. And I'm also pretty sure that. I can keep my relationship with God away from this religion. Mm, So I, my decision to divorce, I actually made that decision in the temple. Wow. Uh, I went to the temple and I said, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to continue my relationship with you outside of this place Mm -hmm. and outside of this church, because that's where I've always kept my relationship with you. For me, church was always about my relationship with God. That was the value that was driving. And if it was down to a single piece, it would be progression. I just wanted to be better. Mm. That was my core value that drove me. Right. Uh, and, and so I thought, you know, I got into this through a decision that I made here. So I might as well bring this back to you. And I'm going to tell you that I will continue my relationship with you away from this place. Mm-hmm. And since then, I not only went through the divorce process, but I never went back to the temple after that. Mm-hmm. And I never went back to church after that. Right. I will tell you that it is, for me at least, I'm a far better Mormon, Christian, Muslim, whatever religion. I'm a far better individual, which I think is the purpose of our all religions, away from that environment. Absolutely. I've done more good with the time that I was spending going to church and patting each other on the back with, oh, we're right and we're in the right religion. Right. And, and the time that I was, you know, getting the kids dressed and shoveling them off to this experience where we would separate and they would go do their thing and someone else would teach them. Now I'm spending that time doing things with the children, teaching them in the home. Right. A lot of the time that I was spending doing this, a lot of the service work that you end up doing in a religious environment is not genuine service work. Mm -hmm. You're like going and helping someone else move who has the means to pay for that themselves but they're just using you. That's not cool. Mm -hmm. That's not service work. Right. Service should be actually going and supporting people who are in a position that they can't help themselves. Right. But that's not what we did. What we did was we went and patted each other on the back. We went and we, we held these activities and we said that we're serving each other, but in reality, we're really not. We're putting on a show and we're giving each other, you know, these, these, congratulatory like oh yeah we're doing something good but we're not and instead i used that time to finish out this framework and do the research i finished my book i finished and i thought of all the things that i could be doing going to church maybe i would help a few people using that time to teach my children using that time to write this book to create 
the, the, the process, the framework, this is going to help thousands of people. So yeah. which is better? And since being away from it, my relationship with God has gotten stronger and I still do a lot of the things that I've always done. We still, we still say nightly prayers with the kids. We still, and it doesn't matter whether you call it praying or whether it's meditation. It's, it's the same thing. You're connecting with something that's beyond yourself. You're taking a moment to reflect, to pause, to demonstrate gratitude. It doesn't, religion is a packaging of principles that matter. Mm -hmm. And you choose the package that best fits. Right. But it's all the same. At least that's my perspective on it. Right. But it took that recognizing that, you know, I do have my relationship with God and this is mm. who that person is to me. And he or she got me into this and he or she's going to get me out of it because I don't need any of this. I don't need anyone else to define who that is for me anymore. Right. And that was the moment where when I was 34, I was like, okay, I know now. And right. now I'm going to take the steps to make this, to divorce in a way that I'm comfortable with. Right. So how, how would you describe your relationship with God right now? I would say that it's a healthy one. It's a loving relationship between parent and child where I believe that I should be doing things that benefit others. I should be doing things to take care of myself. I should be doing things to benefit my family. And I, I in general, the sum of my actions should be towards the improvement of the things around me. Right. That when I die, that I left this place better and that I became a better person through the process. That's it. And how do you, how do you feel God feels about you? I think that, I would think that my, my heavenly parent loves me as much as anybody else. And that, frankly, if my heavenly mother or father didn't love me because of the decisions that I'm making, I don't want to be their child. Right. Like, yeah. that's not a, a God that I would want in my life. Mm -hmm. Just like that, that, if I'm choosing to help myself and then to help others, and I'm, by and large, I make good decisions that benefit the people around me. And if that's not okay with you because of the name that I put on my religious affiliation, I, I don't need that God in my life. Right. And that's not actually love either. No. Right. That's conditional. Exactly. And so, you know, when I work with a lot of families, right? And I, we, so I am a huge advocate for the emotional health of children, right? And healthy families where kids, it's proven that children thrive and grow the best when they're in a loving space where they can't, they're, the love from their parents is not conditional. Yeah. Right. This is, and this is what I work with parents on, you know, making within their home. But this is exactly why I also had to leave the church. I mean, there were several reasons I could, this, that would be another hour. But one of them was because there's no way this is actually love. There's no way that this God actually loves me if I'm afraid of him all the time. And also it is, I'm not emotionally healthy if everything that I do is, is, out, of fear. is out of fear. Yeah. And so leaving the church was a huge thing because I, I just see that the parallel right there, right? This is what we're trying to get away from is parenting your kids with fear, parenting them, scaring them into doing something versus let me hold space for you to be who you really are going to be because we're raising little humans, right? Yeah. Just as God is raising, you know, um, us to be, we're all different. So you can't scare them into doing something and then expect that they're going to be their own person, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right. It's exactly the same dynamic right there. So. Well, that not to me. mention, you know, how much, how much time did we spend talking about what we shouldn't do? Right. Don't drink tea. Don't right. drink coffee. Mm -hmm. Don't drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. Don't use any form of drugs. Don't use, don't do this. Don't do that. Now, logically, in my opinion, the most fucked up thing about all of it mm -hmm. is <laughs> you would be reprimanded and treated worse for drinking a cup of coffee than you would for being unkind right. to another person. Right. What? Exactly. Especially if it was in the name of God, right? So recently someone said to me and they wanted to get me a sweater that said, I'm sorry for the things I said when I was Mormon. Yeah. <laughs> because like I was so judgmental about other people, about other people's families. Like, oh, 
I've been in so many meetings, right? Like in when you're meeting about the children in the in the in your church and you're meeting about other things and you're a teacher within the church. So within the Mormon church, you will get callings, right? Which yeah. is like little assignments, volunteer, volunteer jobs. assignments. Right. And so you would meet together with a group of other women, maybe. So when I was um it's so hard because Mormon has their own lingo. But when I was in one of the teaching capacities um, over the children, we would sit there and have meetings about these families. And I just remember when they were like, what they would say, oh, this child's mother is inactive, which is one of the words, right? So it's either active or active. You're active at church or you're inactive. Mm -hmm. Again, with the whole... Bipolar, like the, the, it, the binary right. thought process. Um, and I would, I remember sitting there going, oh, that poor kid. Mm -hmm. I wonder what went wrong with the mom. And, and immediately I jumped to a whole list of, I bet you she just wants to sin. I bet you, is it coffee? Is it is it porn? Is it, you know, like you just go through this list that you're somehow yeah. you, you have and then you're judging this person for their decisions and then you're like well how do we support this kid right like how do we get mom back at church as if that is our that is what we have to have to do right i mean when i was first learning about all of it and before i was baptized and i would drink tea or drink coffee mm -hmm. i remember the lectures that i received on that right and i remember <laughs> i would be in like the the little room in on sundays and the children who were just, you know, complete shits to me, next to me, like like genuinely rude, like call me terrorist and they were yeah. racist and they were, and the teacher was sitting there talking about, you know, well, you grew up drinking tea and that's something that you're going to have to change. Wow. And they focused on that, that as opposed to, and I'm sitting here looking around like, you had a bunch of racist assholes in here, mm -hmm. but I guess drinking tea is the one that we'll focus on. Right. And so early on, like my, my experience had to be me and God, I was here because of me and God. It wasn't until I was, you know, 20 years later where I decided I don't need anybody. I don't need a place or mm. anyone to define what that is anymore. Right. And I don't need to be here to carry that relationship out. Right. But yeah, I appreciate that's... you coming on and sharing this whole experience. Oh, I yeah. Think no problem. This has I'm been honored. fascinating. Yeah. This has been a lot of fun. We have more. <laughs> we <do> so <laughs> we're going to end this episode okay? and then so. we're going to actually get ready for the next one. So in the meantime, you guys should check out Amanda's work. You can find her at my mommy, the artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, on there, you want to just give us an idea again? Oh yeah, sure. So my mommy, the artist on, on Instagram, mm -hmm. it is a place where I, so one of the things that I do with children is like I said, the little drawings, that's how it all started. Right. Mm -hmm. And so on my Instagram, I will post things, little ideas for how to, um, it's a little story that you can share with your kids and then it'll bring up a bit bigger, more, uh, a deeper concept, I mm -hmm. suppose. So for example, if we have time for me to give an example, of course. um, I was trying to teach my daughter about good friendship, like what good friendship actually looks like. Right. Because, again, I am not going to be the one that throws their dad under the bus and mm -hmm. is like, well, he, he's this and he's that because they don't need to, I don't need, they don't need me to do that. But sure. what I can teach them is this is what a real good friendship and this is what real relationships should feel like. And this is what real love feel like, feels like. And so one of the, for example, one of the things that I drew was a house mm -hmm. with a little gate around it. And I said, this is your house, you know, and how would you feel if, um, you invited a friend in and they were having a bad day. So they started like throwing your stuff around. So I drew all these pictures, right? Like, are they being a good friend? And then she would, you know, I, and there are conversation starts. So I include questions like to ask your kids, like, are they being a good friend? No. What, what would, what would, what would you do if that were you? Right. And then we even talked, I even talked about if you were at a friend's gate and you're like, Hey, can I come in and play? And they said no to you and you threw a tantrum. Because you're angry. You're like, no, I want to, I'm your friend. So let me in. And you started to create, you know, um, no. And then, um, I'm sorry. So I'm talking about like boundaries to yeah. respect other people's no. Right. And then a good friend would honor your no and say, okay, I'll see you later. Come back again sometime. I hope right? you're turning this into a book. Is this going to be a yes, book? I have been, you know what? There is so many people who have said that to me just because I've, I've covered so many topics. And so I might compile them all into one one book i don't think it should be one i think you should do 10 maybe 10 concepts in a book with, right like drawn out i went to a make it a volume one and yikes dude i would buy this i would, would buy this in a heartbeat <laughs> and you. i would promote it nonstop. so that's actually why it, where my mommy the artist came from the name is yeah. because i started drawing so i'm not i wouldn't say that i am some 
excellent artist, but because I like drawing things and that is just how I convey my thoughts. They're good. I've I've seen them. They're good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So that's what's um, on my um, Instagram. And then on my website, this is where you'll also find information about like my consulting, the, you know, the clientele that I work with and things like that. Cause I work hand in hand with therapists who are um, wanting to help their families develop communication skills and things like that. And that's where I come in. And so I kind of develop these uh, or I'm not developing, but I use, um, I developed a program basically that will help these families. So learn how to communicate and how to co-regulation. We can talk about, talk about yeah. self-regulation and methods and steps to get to that point. So you, your home is, Really, we're just trying to decrease the stress of parenthood. Yeah. Okay. In this society, parenting is just, I mean, we got to keep up with, the, you know, Instagram family and all that stuff, you know, and we're so busy. But how, what our main purpose as parents are, I'm bringing it back to that. I love this. I mean, mm-hmm. for our listeners, usually I end the episode with, you know, here's how you can you know, help us out by going leaving reviews and whatnot. Yeah. Right now. Here's how you can help us out. I need this book. So it'd be great if you guys could go and actually give my mommy an artist. My mommy, the artist, will yeah. we'll link her up. So give yeah. Amanda a follow and comment and say, we want this as a book. Oh because my goodness. this would be fantastic to have. And I would buy every volume. Like Thank That's you. why I feel like you don't need to wait for it to be done. I feel like right. there should be 10 in one, you know, 10 in one book and then do a volume two. All right. But I would start with these principles Thank you. right away. Awesome. Thank what a you. great way to translate and to put in the way that simple and fun yeah yeah thank you i appreciate well, cool. it thank you all for listening to the episode we hope you guys enjoyed uh we're actually going to film quite a few more with amanda right now she's in town and we're going to take advantage <laughs> so in the meantime of course we would love you for you to subscribe to the podcast and newsletter which you can find on 12 week relationships we'll also link up all of amanda's stuff and we'll see you guys in the next episode bye <laughs>